Amen. What a joy it is to see you all here this morning. Thanks for joining us. It's a delight to be here with you all. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Because I haven't said this before, we do have some visitors here this morning. Just want to make you know that, we, let you know that we do have some options for uh, young children. We have uh, behind me, we have a nursing mom's room, only for moms, okay? <laughs> only for moms. You can right here, just walk through these doors. If anyone starts looking at you, I will call them out, okay? I always do that. All right, don't worry, just walk right up. And we also have a nursery in our, our back building here, too, for children from zero to three. Those are some great options. We do love our children being in worship, but if they become a distraction to you or to others, we would say that this would be a great way to minister to one unto another. So now we're turning to Matthew chapter 27. We're turning here. We're in the middle of the passion of Christ. We've just last week looked at, excuse me, two weeks ago, looked at Peter's denial of Christ Jesus, but now we turn to Judas and the Jewish leaders, and we see that Jesus, our Lord, is Lord over all. Before we read the text, let's ask the Lord to bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Let's pray together. Lord, what we're about to do, we cannot do without you. The one who hears, the one who speaks, we need you, O Lord to do a mighty work by your spirit. So Lord, as we would even come now to your word to be read, we pray that it would be as it is, the very word of God. And in this moment, oh God, would you speak to us? Your servants, now listen. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 27, beginning in verse one, this is the word of God. For truth resides. Now when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said to him, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away and and hanged himself. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put them into the temple's treasury, since it is the price of blood. And they again conferred together and with the money brought, excuse me, bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel. And they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. Beloved, we serve and worship a God who is over all, a Lord who is Lord over all things. He is not just a Lord that is over some things or even just a lot of things. Our Lord is Lord over all things, everything. And you know that, don't you? That's why you came to a Reformed church this morning, right? You know that truth. But often it is the case that we can forget that. We know that truth, but what we need is a reminder of that truth. I thought Darren's sermon last week in terms of how he helped us remember the Lord is Lord of all was very helpful. 
as he meditated and, and drew out the points about how our Lord is Lord over just even the smallest speck of sand, even to the grand star in the heavens, all those things declare the glory of God. And for them to declare the glory of God means they know that the Lord is Lord over them all. Our Lord is over everything. And we were reminded of that last week. And in part, I see our text fitting into that sphere of reminder. It, it's, this text is exceptional in two ways. One, this is the only gospel of the four that actually details Judas's come to his conscience. It's the only one. The other three gospel writers don't talk about it. We have to actually wait until Luke's Acts edition to find out his study, or his thoughts on it. And I would encourage you later on to compare the two. It's going to take some research, but they do work together. This, is, this text is exceptional for the fact that he presents that. But it's also exceptional in the fact that as he presents it, he is delaying, pressing pause on the main drama. We said that two weeks ago when we talked about Jesus being put on pause for Peter's denials and how significant that was as we looked into Peter's denials. But here again, the pause button is hit after we see in verses 1 and 2 about Jesus and how all the chief priests came and the elders to confer him or to deliver him to death. Here now, Matthew presses the pause button again and he focuses in on Judas. Why? Why? To tell us this point that the Lord is Lord over all things, even the smallest of details in the matter. He is Lord over all. But I think there's another reason why this text is given to us. I think I think it's designed to evoke a response. That is, as we remember that the Lord is Lord over all, if that's all you're doing, that's not enough. That truth comes with a necessary implication. That when you know the truth, you don't just say, hmm, I got it. But that truth evokes a response, sort of like the response that I got last night in my own heart, when I was driving home from working late in the sermon, I know I shouldn't be doing that, right? I was driving home late, it's 9 p.m. at the corner of Reynolds and Duran, and I was waiting for the green light, and all of a sudden the light went green and great, but then at two seconds after that, a car just was speeding past, going right through that red light. And so what did I do? Being the Floridian, not the Georgian, I'm not from Georgia, I laid on my horn brain, you know, say, don't you dare do that. That's what I was trying to say with my little weak RAV4, you know, beep, beep. I was trying to say that, right? I'm, s and so I laid on my horn, I watched that guy go by. Instead of putting my gas, you know, put my foot on the pedal and start driving. You know why? Because there, after that guy went another guy. Five seconds later, it was his buddy. Similar cars, I'm guessing. But in that moment, I was like, I'm so, because my head was like this. I was looking out, laying on the horn. I did not look at the second person. But you know what? In that moment, the Lord was Lord of even this full Floridian that was laying his hand on the horn instead of putting his foot, his, foot, his foot on the gas pedal and driving. But as, as, I, as I realized that the Lord is Lord over everything, it evoked a response. Do you know what that response was? One, a little bit of anger. But then secondly, of thanksgiving. I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. That should be a response. I was praying a little bit for his conscience to be convicted through my weak horn, because I blew my horn at that guy again. But, but really, ultimately, it came out of thanks, and it was a worshipful experience being able to say, thank you, O Lord, that you even, through my own, you know, <laughs> my jazzed up heart, laying my hand on the horn that I didn't drive out there. When we see that the Lord is Lord over us all and everything, it should provoke a response in us. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Because we're going to see that the Lord is Lord over all in two particular spheres. 
He is Lord over the chaos and he's Lord over the conscience. But I don't just want to tell you that, that factual thing, he's Lord over the chaos and the conscience. I want you to, to respond. And so I, my actual points are actually what you are to do in light of the Lord being over those things. Okay, so that's what we're going to focus on here this morning. So there are two points this morning. Because he is Lord over the chaos, we need to trust him. We need to trust him. Now, as we look at our passage here, chaos is perhaps one of the best words to describe what's going on. Perhaps pandemonium. I mean, just, I know that we have read this passage so many times, and we're, it's become so commonplace to us. It's not chaotic. But put yourself in the shoes of the, the first century believer, right? Or perhaps just in the person who lived in Jerusalem. This was a very chaotic time. And particularly in our text, there's a lot of chaos going on. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. When morning came, all the chief priests and all the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. And what's chaotic about that? Well, remember just a couple days, maybe even a full week before, everyone was coming together to praise the name of Jesus. Hosanna! Hosanna to the Lord. He who comes in the name of the Lord. Everyone's putting down palm fronds, worshiping him, saying, this is a great day. The king is coming. The anointed one is coming. They're excited about this. But now, what are all the leaders of the people doing? They're seeking to put him to death. And they're delivering him over to the Gentiles, the governor, Pilate. This is, this is madness. But perhaps another way we can measure this chaos is we look at Judas, verse 3. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Now another part of chaos is that the unexpected happened. The unexpected happens. And this is very unexpected. Remember Judas with his hard heart left the Lord's Supper that evening. Satan entered into him, one of the gospel writers says, and he betrayed him by using that sign of tenderness, a kiss of greeting. Here, now Judas with that hard heart is now being chiseled down, broken. He's feeling remorse and he's taking action. This is very unexpected, isn't it? More than that, look what happens. After he's turned away in verse 4, but they said to him, what is that to us? See to that yourself. He find, found no consolation in the leaders. So he threw the pieces of silver into the temple treasury. The commentators suggest perhaps it was over the wall, like a toss over since they wouldn't receive it. And he left and he went away and hanged himself. What did he do? He, he hurt himself. He killed himself. Now, I want to say more about this as the family talk in our second point. But it's important at this junction, juncture to, to mention that when you hurt yourself, you're not solving any problems. You're actually bringing down more problems for other people. You're not solving that's the, that's the twisted thought that people have in their mind that is so much into their depression and their own hurt and can't see anything. They think it's just better if they're, that, they're not around. That's not true. It makes it worse for everyone else. It's unresolved pain that can never be solved. It's so hurtful. And that's why I, I say this really is chaos because this is a nightmare. A nightmare of chaos. But I come back to, to note one other dynamic of chaos, and that's the chief priests. Here are the spiritual leaders of the people, and a man comes to them with a very contrite, or perhaps deeply afflicted conscience, in, at least. And what do they do to him? They say, what is that to us? 
isn't that a tremendous reversal? I mean, aren't the spiritual leaders of God's people supposed to help God's people when they're struggling? And when that's not, that something's wrong, that's, a, that's an upheaval of what is meant to be. Furthermore, look what they care about. The chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it is the price of blood. Wait a minute. Who gave Judas this money? You did. They did, right? They did. They can't now. They gave it. They're both guilty here, right? They're both guilty. They both have done terrible things. But now they can't receive the money. <laughs> they can't receive. this. It's just fascinating. They, can, they can't help Judas in life, but they can, and, and others, but they can help him in death. Boy, that's just a total upheaval. Of everything. It's lunacy. Crazy. This is chaos. That's what we see going on in our text. And yet, in that moment, we're presented with, with verses 9 and 10. Let's say this. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price who had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. What is Matthew seeking to tell us? Why did he tell us all these crazy details and then say all of this is fulfilling the word of the Lord? Well, the answer is this. That Matthew's saying that the Lord is Lord over everything even the smallest detail of even the one who betrayed his son. I mean, he's over all things, even the chaos, even the things that we look at and we say, this doesn't make sense, I can't put it together. Even that sense of being overwhelmed by that wave that crashes down upon us and sends us spinning around in the ocean, not knowing which way is up. In the middle of the chaos that we feel, what we should remember is, is that our Lord is Lord over all, even the chaos. And he's directing it, orchestrating it, even ordaining it, allowing things to happen for his own purpose. That's exactly what Matthew is telling us. And he's telling us this for a reason. That as we're reading about what is happening to Jesus and him being bound and seeing Judas and, and the Jewish leaders and doing all this, God is saying, I am working not out pandemonium and chaos, but my perfect plan. What we have to learn to do in the middle of the chaos is learn to trust the Lord who is over all. And, and, and really, we need to appreciate exactly the context of how this is said. Remember, chaos is happening. Every, people are like, what is going on? And in the middle of it, as they can't even imagine the plans of the Lord, which are greater than ours, God is actually saving them. Could it be that the very chaos that you're experiencing in your life is the very means by which God is using to save you? Practically? And he saved us ultimately, finally, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, the atonement, it is finished. But how the Lord makes that truth to come as he applies that, that blood, the blood of Christ to our hearts, the confession talks about the Holy Spirit as he does that, we're understanding exactly how he is saving us and revealing to us more about ourselves and our sin and him and his greatness. Our Lord is Lord over all, and we need to learn to trust him. Children, I want you to draw a picture of a very still ocean. A very still ocean. It's very easy. It's a straight line, okay? Straight line with maybe two banks, okay? Straight line. That's what it looks like. You can do that. Straight line. The reason I want you to draw that is because I want you to think about the picture that is given in Revelation 4. Revelation 4. Revelation 4 comes just before the, 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 the breaking of the seals. Just before the pouring out the bowls of wrath. When judgment and chaos and Armageddon reigns on the earth and total destruction. Everything's going, wow, 
what's going on? Half the world dies about five or six times, right? Yeah, or everyone dies, right? That's, that's, that's the idea that everyone doesn't believe in the Lord is going to be judged. And it, from our perspective, it looks like just that there's no logic or reason to anything. And yet, the scene in heaven in chapter 4, verse 6, is of the Lord on his throne before a sea of glass or crystal. And what is that to say? That is to say that there is not even a drop of water that is out of place in conjunction with the Lord's plan. He can see through it all. It's perfect. He knows everything from the shallowest to the deepest. He knows everything. And it's working out just perfectly according to his plan. So that's why, children, I want you to think about it. That's how you need to understand because in the middle of our chaos, our sense of being overwhelmed, whether it's in our own life or with our own emotions and feelings, with our own family members, our kids and our, our, our spouses at our workplaces, in the world, we're like, ah, I don't know what's going on. But God does. And he's working out his perfect plan. And what we need to learn to do is to trust him. Trust him. You know, I, I, I'm, a friend reminded me of this verse just past week, 2 Corinthians 1.8. Paul talks about this similar experience about just being overwhelmed. He says, and he's relating to the Corinthian church, he says, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our affliction which came to us in Asia, Asia that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired of even life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. Paul went through real problems. We go through real problems. Paul went through problems that perhaps even exceed ours. Paul was proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was not only just put in jail, but he was beaten, he was stoned, he was left for dead, he was whipped, he endured a lot. And what, what was it like for him in the middle of that time? He says he despaired of life, he had even the sentence, the judgment of death within himself, and he really was at bottom. We don't talk about being at bottom. Paul was there. But he has this thought. He says, but wait. We indeed have the sentence of death within ourselves so that the purpose, we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Meaning that even if he was to die, God's plan would be perfect. And he believed in that, and he trusted in that, and he learned to trust in that because he found that he couldn't trust himself to make sense of the chaos, to have that wonderful plan to keep all his children in line, all his employees, and make sure there's always money in the bank. We can't do that stuff. When we find the end of ourselves, we find the beginning of God. And we learn to trust him. Trust in him who can do the impossible. Can I tell you this? When it comes down to, just think about this theoretically, when it comes down to the notion of chaos, God doesn't even have a definition for it. Did you know that? I mean, chaos means that you don't know what's going on. There's no plan. God always has a plan. He never has a plan B. It's always a plan A. It's, it's like kind of trying to, to su surprise God, right? You know, little children come from behind the corner, boo, and scare you, and then the parents go for a second, oh, right? We pretend that we're scared because we heard those little footsteps coming. We heard their breathing. We knew they were there, right? How much more so to God? He knows everything's going to happen, and we, he comes out, we, we boo, and we try and scare him. He knows it's going to happen. There's no surprise to God. There's no chaos to God. He knows everything. What does that tell us, though? You need to start trusting him. Saying, Lord, I don't, know what I'm, I don't know what's going on, but I know that you know what's going on, and I trust you. You know, you can actually, in the moment, you can find peace in the moment of chaos. How? By placing your trust in him. Say, Lord, I trust you. 
And, and what that looks like, young people, is instead of putting it on your planning, putting it on your ability, and on your thought process, staying up late at night, what you do is you take that, you say, Lord, this is all yours. I trust you. You're going to work out this perfect plan. Trust you. Every time, and your mind's going to run back, and you say, nope, it's with the Lord. Trust him. I believe him. I don't know what's going on. He does. In this, I am confident. Psalm 27 speaks. I could keep talking about this point. I love this point. David is surrounded by his enemies. Even an army in camp against me. In this, I'll be confident. One thing I ask, and this I will seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That I may meditate upon and meditate in his temple and gaze upon his beauty. He's saying, Lord, you got this. Is that where you are in the middle of your chaos? I'd encourage you to do that. Trust him this morning. That's point number one. But then point number two, we need to look back here because we see the Lord is Lord over all, not just the chaos. But he's also Lord of the conscience. And we are, as a result of him being Lord of the conscience, we are to go to him. Go to the Lord of the conscience. So here we have two groups of people that have a moment of conscience. There's first Judas in verse 3. Look with me there. It says, then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, that is, Jesus had been condemned. Perhaps Matthew leaves it in the vague he as to say perhaps even Judas was feeling that. He, that is Judas, felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. Now, we've, we mentioned how this is remarkable. I would say, I would go even further, that Judas, at this moment, his conscience is being pricked. And he displays quite a robust conscience. In terms of the theological categories that we put out there, he felt remorse, contrite. Verse 3. He sought to make uh, restitution. He returned the 30 pieces of silver. He even made a confession, a verbal confession. I have sinned by betraying blood. All of this, his conscience was starting to come alive. But that's not the only person whose conscience was starting to come alive. The chief priests. Now, they came, it came a little late. They didn't respond to Judas. Usually, when a, one conscience is pricked, the other conscience is pricked too. It's, it's, it's wonderful how that happens in marriage. Satan doesn't want you to soften, but the first one to soften actually wins the battle, and the other person softens too. Because the Holy Spirit's seeing which one of you is going to be soft first. And then he's going to use the other one to affect the other person. But here, it doesn't happen. Here, it doesn't happen. But yet, their conscience is pricked about the money. It is not lawful to put into the temple treasury since it is the price of blood. And so they conferred together with the money bought, and they bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. As we can talk about the burial place, how it was, you call the potter's field because they would dig out the clay and there would be these holes in the ground. It would be a great place to bury people who don't have much money. We could talk about that. But, but really, I think the point that we are to understand here is that there are two consciences, that, two types of consciences that are being pricked. And those consciences being pricked are actually the means to which God accomplishes his ends his perfect plan. That is, by, con by convicting the conscience of Judas and the conscience of the Jewish leaders, it leads to God's will in 9 and 10 from the prophets. But here is the point I want to make. The Lord isn't just Lord of the conscience, excuse me, the other conscience, the, as I was trying to say, the Lord isn't just the Lord of the chaos, but as he's able to prick a conscience in whatever way he wants, he is also the Lord of the conscience, the Lord of it. That's the magisterial statement that is said in our confession of faith, that the Lord, that God alone is Lord of the conscience. And I, I want to tell you that this day because we're being told by the media that really it's just a voice in our head. 
But perhaps it's just an angel, as they say, or a devil, right? Up there on our shoulders. Beloved, that's not true. What that is, is God pricking your heart. And what he's doing is he's doing what many good surgeons have to do in order to get to the spot they can be healed. They have to slough off, cut off the hard skin and get down to the soft spot. Children, I want you to draw a heart, a simple heart, and a heart just being pricked and starting to bleed. Because that's exactly what God is seeking to do. As he prompts the conscience, as he comes in there and taps the conscience, he wants that conscience to come undone. And he is doing that and he's displaying how he is over that. And yet, there's a problem here. The problem is, is both Judas and the Jewish leaders don't go far enough. Did you notice that? Even as Judas confesses his sins, admits that, he's, admits that he has sinned against innocent blood, how he's feeling remorse and seeks to make restitution, he fails to do something. And he takes things into his own hands and tries to alleviate his conscience. And so too with the Jewish leaders not responding to the right thing, the man who is breaking down before them and admitting their guilt, they seek to alleviate their conscience by doing a lesser good. And people do that all the time. These men didn't go far enough in the pricking of their conscience. And where didn't they go? They didn't go to the Lord. Now, it's a fascinating picture to see this. Now that we said all of that, Jesus isn't the only one that is bound in this text. Judas and the Jewish leaders are bound in their conscience to the Lord. But they miss the picture, the important picture, that Jesus was allowing himself to be bound in order to set consciences free in order to free people that turn to him, that go to him. And this is where we see that, that picture in John 21 after, you know, this is the, the, the time that, that Peter sees Jesus. And what does Peter do when he sees Jesus on the shore and he realizes it's him? He doesn't wait for that boat to get there. He jumps into the water. He is running to his Lord. Why? Because he knows that his Lord is Lord of the conscience that can set him free. And beloved, I want you to know that this morning. And I don't want you to fall short in terms of your conscience. And the guilt you bear for the sin that you have committed. Whether 10 years ago or yesterday. I want you not only just to confess that sin to the people that you sinned against, make, seek to make restitution, feel bad about it. I want you to go even further to the one who was bound for you to set you free. I want you to go to Jesus. I want you to find in him deliverance, forgiveness. He that calls upon him that goes to him, that believes in him, shall not be disappointed. Remember what Jesus did to show that he can forgive sins? Remember how he was before the Pharisees, these, these chief priests and elders, and even before Judas, and they were doubting that he has the ability to forgive sins? What did he do? You remember Matthew chapter 9? He healed the paralytic so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, stand up and walk, and he did. Maybe that's something that you need to hear this morning, as you would bear a guilty conscience for what you have done in times past, or perhaps even the present. You need to go to him and find in him forgiveness that he's, he offers unto all, that he grants us. Oh, I would plead with you, go to Jesus and Here's where we come to the family discussion about hurting yourself. Hurting yourself won't help. It's not going to make it any easier. It's selfish. 
It's downright foolish. It's breaking the sixth commandment. And ultimately, it solves nothing because you still got to face Jesus. Still have to face him. Why not learn to go to him now? Go to him now before you have to face him. Face him before, before you know, as the call to worship says, that we will have to bow the knee to him. Why not bow the, the knee to him now and say, Lord, there's no way that I can free myself from this guilty conscience. Would you free me from it? I hear that you forgive sinners. Would you forgive me? Would you take off this burden off my back? Like pilgrim, right? Christian. Take that burden off. Would you do that for me? Can, can I encourage you this morning, if you're despairing and have, have great struggle of depression in your heart, can I tell you the fact that you feel bad about what you've done is actually a ray of hope. It's a ray of hope coming to you in your life that you're not destitute of the seed of promise that God has given to you because you believe it. You feel bad about it. And really, the Lord is using that to convict your heart. Really, the problem is, isn't that you, that you feel bad, and that's actually good. The problem isn't you're not turning to Jesus yet. And you've got to turn to him. He can, he has, he will deliver you. He does. Don't hurt yourself. Don't do any of that. But let me also say this, because many people who are dealing with hurt don't talk about it, but they tell someone else, a close friend. Can I talk to you close friends for a moment? You need to help that person get to Jesus. How do you do that? Well, you do more. When someone tells you that they're despairing of even life, you need to ask the hard questions. And you need to also say to them, I don't know if I can leave you alone right now. I'm going to take you to someone who can really help. Now, really, we don't have the ability, even as a church, to force someone to do something. But the civil authorities do. And thank the Lord that even in our day, that there are so many persons who don't even know the Lord that want to protect and preserve life. And so we would readily, readily, Seek the help of those that can help a person in great need. And so what you can do in helping, in helping someone, as you hear that, you can say, I know you need Jesus, and you also need some really help, real help right now. I'm going to take you to someone who can help you. Beloved, I've done that twice to one person, and that person is still alive today, and they're believing in Jesus Christ. It was hard and it was scary. And that person didn't like me when that happened. But they're still here today. And beloved, that's perhaps what we need to do. When we hear our family members, our friends, they're going through really hard times, we need to offer real help. Not just platitudes, Jesus can help you. Not just prayers, let me pray for you. You say, we're going to get some help. And then you take them to that help, that hospital, and then you walk them through that process. You be that friend that is closer than a brother, seeking to be Christ to them. And you help them. You say, Jesus can help you. He has helped me. I know. Beloved, we must go to him. And then sometimes we must help others go to them. Please, let's go to him. This is a family discussion here. It talks about it in the scriptures. And I needed to talk to you about that this morning. Please hear my heart that we need to go to Christ. Let's go to him right now in prayer. Let's pray together. The Lord, you are indeed Lord of all. You're Lord of us all. You're Lord over everything. And we cry out to you this morning. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'd help us. Help us in the middle of the chaos we're feeling. The upside down, the inside out. We, we're not in control. But help us to say, good, my God is, and rest. And also, Lord, in the middle of our despair and our guilty conscience, help us to turn to you. 
Help us to realize that as we bang the floor, we perhaps can bang on the doors of heaven until they open up to us and we find the good news that is promised to us in the scriptures. That a sinner can be saved. A sinner can be relieved of all their guilty conscience because the blood of Jesus can wash us clean. Oh Lord, we thank you. Help us, we pray. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.